Welcome to Champion Minded, the podcast for those who aim for excellence, not only in the sports arena, but in life. My name is Alistair McCaw, author, speaker, mindset and performance coach, and my goal is to help you unleash your unlimited potential and provide you with the tools to achieve greatness. Are you ready to become Champion Minded? Then let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome to the Champion Minded Podcast or welcome back to it. I'm Alistair McCall. In this episode of What It Takes, I'll be speaking to Kate Richardson Welsh. But before we get into this really cool interview with Kate, I just want to say a massive thanks to all of you who have left a rating or review. Um, This one from 305 Beast Mode Fit and here she says, I've seen her in person, read his books and now I'm listening to Alistair's podcasts. As a fellow coach, I love hearing the different insights from players and coaches around the globe and throughout the sports spectrum. He's a preacher of positive energy, and it's always a good idea to tune in for some inspiration. Thank you so much for leaving that one, 305 Beast Mode. Uh, The next one is from Rodrigo, uh, life-changing. This podcast has added great value to my coaching style and life routines. Thanks so much. Topfer2323 says, if you're looking for something positive to start your day or for for motivation, this is the podcast for you. I've just recently found this podcast and I love it. And then one more, Fudame uh, writes, love listening, easy to follow and great message every time. Looking forward to listening to more to come. Guys and girls, thank you so much for leaving those reviews. I greatly appreciate it. But moving on with this episode, as I mentioned, we have Kate Richardson Walsh, OBE. Uh, Kate is a former Olympic gold and bronze medal winning uh, hockey player. She was capped a record 375 times, which is incredible for her country and was the England and Great Britain captain for 13 years, a phenomenal career. She was born in Worthington, Manchester. And in this episode, we get into uh, a lot of leadership. I really wanted to pick her brain on leadership because obviously being a captain of a sports team for 13 years is no small feat. We discuss setbacks and failure, how she dealt with those. The moment things changed for her in her career, some of her influences growing up. She also shares some advice on dealing with pressure, uh, what she misses most from her playing uh, years. Now also being a coach, uh, I asked her what are two things she looks for in a captain and leader. Also we discuss about having the hard conversations because as being a leader, as being a captain, you have to have those hard um, conversations and she gives some really, really good feedback there as well. Also some fun questions at the end uh, that I know you guys will enjoy. But without further ado, this is Kate Richardson Walsh. Hey, Kate, welcome to the Champion Minded Podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Yeah, I've been listening to, uh, to quite a few of your podcasts over the years, and um, I'm excited. So am I, so am I. Obviously, I've, I've done a lot of research on you. I follow you on Twitter as well, which I have for, for some time. Um, your achievements are ast- astonishing. Also, we're going to get into a lot of leadership in this particular episode. That is one of the main areas I really want to focus in on you, because... You were the captain of the, the GB squad, the England squad, for 13 years? Yeah, they couldn't get rid of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or no, nobody else wanted the job, I don't know. But, yeah. but besides that, I mean, I don't know anybody in sports who's been in the captaincy role for 13 years, to be honest, um, in a team. So first of all, that's, that's phenomenal. But before we go there... Um, the first question I've been asking my guests, especially in the last few months, is how has the last year been for you? We're still in the pandemic, so to say, especially the UK is in probably the biggest lockdown in the world right now. I feel for you guys mm-hmm. in a way. Um, but how's it been for you and how have you, how have you been keeping busy? Yeah, I mean, my wife uh, also played in the national team, same length of time as me. So we did kind of joke that the the whole of our 17-year international athletics career was uh, kind of getting us ready for COVID and lockdown because, you know, there's, you know, enforced staying inside. You, you know, there's there's rules that you, you can't break. You have to be able to 
manage your state to be able to communicate that to somebody who you're in very close quarters with and be able to function in a really small space. We're in a lovely place, but it's, you know, two-bed flat with no outside space, so we are really privileged in lots of ways, but also, you know, that has its own challenges. So we do feel that it has been... It's, we've, we've gotten through it together. It's taken a lot of communication. We've got a 14-month-old little girl. Helen gave birth to, to Piper. She is a... I saw that. Congratulations. <laughs> Belated congratulations. Thank you, yeah. So it's um it's been a blessing that we've been able to spend so much time with her and just watch her grow and develop and, and learn. So that's been a real blessing. And getting any sleep, I'm sure, obviously, that's that was a massive change in your lives. Yeah, like true athletes, we got her on a routine as soon as possible. So, I, I, you know, after a few weeks, we were really trying to get her to, you know, because I feel like we have to teach them what is night and what is day. They don't know. So I, we just got her as soon as possible into that routine. And, and also maybe it's just genes, but she is a really good sleeper. So she's been sleeping through from seven till seven, pretty much from couple of months so and sleeping in the day as well so we are very lucky in that we keep saying I don't know how parents cope I don't know how they cope when they don't sleep because no sleep is like torture and uh, the big question is I'm sure you've had it is she going to be the next Helen or the next Kate have you already got her, her first <laughs> miniature hockey stick yet <laughs> she has got her first hockey stick but we don't we're not going to be uh pushing her in any direction we just wanted to just you know, try lots of different sports. If sport is for her, great. You know, hopefully we can find, you know, there's so many. I hope she can find one that, that she likes and has fun with, with her friends. Um, but if not, if it's the arts or whatever it is, um, you know, just to just to follow her passion and to be happy and fulfilled. I think that's our biggest aim for her. That's awesome. So let's go back to where it all began f uh, for you. Obviously, um, you know, where you were brought up, how you were introduced first into hockey. Did you play other sports? Um, how were your parents? So I'd love to get into that, that, that side of, of your story. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Stockport, which is in South Manchester in the northwest of, of England. Um, Mum and Dad were both really sporty. Both PE teachers trained um as and uh, my sister two years younger than me was also really sporty um but probably initially um I did most individual sports so gymnastics from quite a young age I mean I did try ballet but I don't think I lasted too long there um and then um swimming my, my sister and I both heavily got into swimming and swam at Stockport Metro which is quite a, a good club uh, in England and got to the kind of point where I was going to have to really choose. And it was at that time that I started to go to secondary school. So I was 11, 12. And that was the first time I picked up a hockey stick. Um, so it was just in my PE lessons. I went to my local state school and had a really passionate, enthusiastic PE teacher who loved hockey in particular and just was just phenomenal at just giving that passion to everybody else. And um, I think that was just the, the most wonderful thing because my, my parents, of course, were really supportive and would have taken us everywhere and they did but I think having that that PE teacher to really guide me to you know put me in for trials without her um, and that support I wouldn't have gotten onto the pathway when I did so I started yeah 11 12 um I didn't go to any club until I was 13 and I went to my mom's club um and yeah played with the with the women which was um which was really it was good. It's lots of hard lessons. I, I kind of feel like I learned to play the game, playing with those women, really experienced, much older, um, and the game in, within the game, kind of. You know, they they really got it. And um, and you were you were around about thirteen at this this age. Yeah, thirteen. Yeah, so playing against adult women. So it was you know I was not particularly big or strong at this at this age at all um and so I had to learn to kind of look after myself and um and how to hold my stature and and be on the field you know be almost bigger than I was so that definitely I think really helps um and then got into the, the system so I got sent to county trials which is just like local local trials and I so I played for Greater Manchester and then from there I played for the north of England and then England juniors when I was what would I have been? 14 around the trials would have been. 
Um, and then, yeah, 15. And was just, I was just, I was just in awe of, of everybody else. I, I totally felt like a fish out of water. I just was along for the ride and, you know, I thought it was going to end any minute. I definitely wasn't one of the main players who would stand out, who you'd kind of look at and go, oh, yeah, she's she's definitely going to be selected. Um, and I was also kind of, I guess, fortunate in terms of where hockey was going. So hockey is a sport, offside had been taken away. So now we had no offside. And it started to change the skill sets, the ability of players that was required to, to excel in the game. It went from it is still a very technical sport, but it also then brought in an athletic element. Unfortunately for me, although I hated running, I cannot tell you how much I hated running when I was in early teens. But I learned to develop the the love or the discipline of, of running, and found that I could fight, get a headspace somewhere and get into it and and go and, and do it. And that just helped me. And at that time, that's where hockey was going. So it was kind of just a really nice timing for me. And, and I guess coaches who saw something in me that was going to be of the time and believed in me and gave me that belief and just kept putting me through for things. Mm. Now, obviously, going back to your parents there, um, they gave you a choice to, to you know, be involved in various sports. You mentioned their gymnastics and swimming. And in fact, I always said if I had a daughter, um, I'd want her to do swimming and gymnastics. And I'm not just saying that because you said that because I find those two sports were... Um, well, you know, all sport is great. Don't get me wrong, but um, especially gymnastics is is gives you a lot of confidence at a very young age. You know, it's something where you try at fourteen, fifteen. It's uh, something you don't want to do because the fear is already there. In, in, in other words, but um, just talking about your parents, how were they? Were they uh, very supportive? Were they were, were they pushy? How how was that? Because a lot of the times you see some, you know, an athlete who's made it. There's always been either. Both parents or one of the parents has been pushy, so to say. Yeah, I definitely definitely wouldn't ever, I never felt pushed. Um, I definitely felt supported. And, I, and certainly if my sister or I just, you know, decided we didn't want to do that anymore, if we weren't having fun anymore, I, I think they would have, well, they would have noticed, but they also would have asked us. And I think they would have been totally fine with that. Um, I think they probably would have given us other opportunities to try other sports with those two both being, you know, they played cricket, mum played netball, indoor cricket, hockey, golf, like, you know, whatever was available, I think they had a go at. So I think they probably would have just tried something else. But we both, my sister and I both fell into hockey and loved it straight away. So that was kind of deal done. Mm. Were you someone from a very young age who set goals and set targets? I mean, was was the vision to be the player that you became? Absolutely not. No, not at all. You know, I look back to my younger days and I, I didn't really have any goals or ambitions at all. I didn't, I just didn't think that life was for me. I just felt like I was just going to go on the conveyor belt of life and like everybody else and just go through the motions and go to college, go to university fall in love, get married, settle down, you know, and I just thought that was going to be where my life was at, and, you know, I could watch the Olympics, or, and Wimbledon, particularly, and be like, wow, you know, they're amazing, but never in a million years thought that was, ever thought that that was for me at all. So even um, though you were, even though you were a, a good junior, you never watched the Olympics and thought, I want to be there? No, I, I watched it and thought, God, that is amazing. And I would, I would definitely feel emotion. Like, I vividly remember, um, you know, Olympic ceremony, medal ceremonies. And then when, you know, BBC would play a montage and, you know, it'd be like the anthem, the flag going up and the, the replay of the race, maybe it was athletic. And I would feel, I'm get tingles now. I would really feel it and be like, just think, wow, that's incredible. Just, just, but just didn't, no, just didn't think that was for me. I wasn't. I wasn't excellent. I wasn't, um, as I say, I wasn't a standout. So I think that just made me feel like it was for the other people who were better than me. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, especially at that, that, that age as well. Where did it change for you where you thought this could be a career for me? This actually might be the, the, the direction I'm going in a full-time basis, so to say. What, around about what age? I mean, it wasn't an opportunity to really be a full-time basis until goodness until the Leeds and London Olympic Games I would have been 29 but there definitely was a point uh, and it did come fairly early on so I was as I said I played for the England of the 16s when I was 14 15 
the next year, when probably I was the right age to be selected, um, I got dropped. And it came as a real shock. Um, because I'd been in the year before, you know, I don't know, maybe I got a little bit complacent. I mean, I certainly wasn't doing anything good for my body, for my mind, in any way, shape or form. And I remember the letter coming through the post. I remember opening the letter at home, just seeing a list of names and my name wasn't on there. And, you know, I still, I still now today get emotional about it. I've still got the letter as well. Um, and I remember running upstairs and eventually my mom kind of sat me down and said, well, you know, what do you want to do about it? And she comforted me and she, you know, she cared for me, but she, she ultimately she said, what do you want to do about it? And it was just the best question because it wasn't what my mom or dad wanted or anybody else. It was, I had to ask myself that question and through some support through, of my coaches and my parents, I, over that summer, started to answer that, that question and, and realised, yeah, I really want to do this. I want, I just want to be the best hockey player that I can be. And I think that's all I really was focusing on. Um, but I knew that was going to mean making different choices, better choices. Um, I went to a different hockey club that was in the top league. So I could train with some of the internationals, be coached by the England international coach. Um, start loving to the discipline of running, as I said, eating better food, working out my schedule, my of my schoolwork and everything better so I could get the study done and do my training and look after myself and just became very disciplined um, from that point on, so 16, 17. Would you say that was the turning point for you of, of receiving that letter? I mean, I can relate to you because... At the end of the year, getting my report card in the post, I would either try and make a plan that it would disappear or it was just that fear because, <laughs> because academically I was not, not, not great. So it was that, that fear. But um, would you say that that was the, the, the turning point for you in your career of saying, okay, I've come to the fork in the road. Now, you know, as, as you're, you, you had that discussion with your mom, now you make a decision. Yeah, 100%. And I'm, in some ways, I feel really blessed and lucky that it happened then when it did. So that, that you know, that just really... And the, and the support, as, again, that made me really decide what I wanted to do and how I was going to go about it. And I think all of that thought process, you know, at a relatively young age when there's a lot going on, 16 or 17, um, and I think some of the things I had to say no to at that age and, and turn away from actively... Um, I think that just really gave me fire. Did you see those as sacrifices or, or more as choices? Yeah, choices. I always say choices. I, I never felt like I was missing out on anything. I, that's, and, and maybe that's what made it easier. And maybe, you know, having made those choices and gone and started going down that path, I didn't ever look back and think, oh, God, no, I wish I was doing that or, God, I'm missing out on that. I just didn't think that at all. I just thought... This feels right and good to me, so let's just keep going. Now, I want to get back to setbacks because that's obviously an important area because in sports, there's so many setbacks that can happen from, as you mentioned, they're being dropped from the team, injuries obviously being the biggest one um, of how to handle that. But let's, let's stay basically a little bit with your, your upbringing and influences. Who, were, who would you say were your, your, you know, you mentioned just before we got on the call, um, one of your or your teachers, or actually maybe you did mention it on the call. My apologies. Um, one of your teachers was uh, an influence on you. Who who else was an influence in your career growing up? So, yeah, definitely my parents and my sister, who was also a phenomenal hockey player. She also played internationally. Um, I guess my the, so when I moved to that club um, that was in the national league, there was a group of us probably six or seven of us, similar age, who were all vying to be in the junior international teams and were really trying to push to get into that, into that first team at that club. And I think just being around some peers who, similar age, similar drive, had been making similar decisions and, were, and could have fun together, I think that definitely really helped. Um, and then the coach of that club, Maggie Suyar, who was the England coach at the time, um, she just saw something in me um, and, yeah, just really instilled instilled that belief. I remember asking me a question. I must have been 70, yeah, I was 17. And she turned to me and said, you know, what's, what is your ambition? 
she's a very serious lady. She is a very serious lady. And um, I thought I really have to answer this question well. You know, she's she's an England coach. She's my she's my club coach. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be ambitious. I was like, I'm, I want to try and get in the under twenty ones, England under twenty ones. And she just turned to me and said, "You need to be focused on going to the Sydney Olympic Games." And I was like. But yeah, I thought, okay, whatever. I, I'm not really, I'm not fully behind that at the moment. But just her saying that to me gave me the belief that that I could. She believed in me, and it gave me that belief from that point on. Mm-hmm. We all need someone to believe in, isn't? I think I think the most four powerful words in coaching and mentoring are "I believe in you." And I think you know, as coaches, we you know, you're you're coaching now, correct? If if I understand, yes. yeah. So, and we're going to get into that as well. But you know. We have no idea, especially working with young kids, what type of families they're coming from, what chaos they're possibly coming from. You could be that only person that actually believes in them, as 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 unfortunate as that sounds. I mean, in, in coaching, we hold such a responsibility. Uh, you know, and this is what I try and share with other coaches, is that you could be that child's only hope. Now, that wasn't your case. You had loving parents. You had a sister. You had, a, uh, by the sounds of it, a, a loving um, family. But... Um, in coaching, it's so important that we don't know what that, that child is coming from. No. Every leader leaves a trace. Yeah. And whether you like it or not, and whether you think you're a leader, you are leaving a trace. Exactly, yeah. For me personally, my influences were, were my, my mother, who was a, a great 400-meter athlete. She trained under Mary Peters. Now, that might be way before mm-hmm. your time, but she was an no. Olympian in Northern Ireland. I was born in Belfast, actually. and. Um, no. that, yeah, that's where a little bit I got my genes in running, th- thanks to my mom. She was a, a Commonwealth Games uh, um, uh, trialist in 400 meters, so she had a good good level. Um, but and, and also a, a track and field coach, um, Caroline Foster, growing up as well. They were both the same, cut from the same cloth. I don't know if you, you, you will know Pat Summit, the, the legendary basketball coach. Uh, yeah. Has a fantastic book one or two books out as well which I recommend everybody to read but she's one of my or, or still is even though unfortunately she passed away a few years uh, one of my um, people I, I, I look up to and, and learn from still and I still watch her videos but my mother and and that coach who was also a teacher were cut from the same cloth tough um, Lots of kids didn't like like her because she was tough. You know what I mean? Oh, I hope I don't get her. She's 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 you know. But I wanted those teachers because I knew that discipline and that toughness would make me would make me better because I was brought up in that in that so to say. So those were two definitely massive influences for me, which I still take to today with that that level of discipline. You know, so most grateful. But moving on to your playing career, tell me what it was like when you first got. Invited to the first, obviously senior camp. Now you're in the the GB team. How was that experience for you? Were you incredibly nervous? Were you anxious, or had you already spent enough time around those people to be comfortable? Yes, uh, I was definitely nervous. But I think having gone to that club and been training with international players, I didn't go alone. I think I even travelled with with one of them to the first camp. Um, and that certainly made me feel like I belonged a little bit. But I do remember kind of turning up and seeing, you know, some of the players that obviously I was playing against <clears throat> in the National League. And, you know, and some, some people like Jane Sixsmith, who in, in Great Britain was just, you know, an icon in hockey and was one of the first female hockey players to kind of break out into the media, was on TV. So, you know, I would have watched her on TV. And, and so seeing her for the first time, and thinking oh, I'm in the same team as her was definitely daunting. But they were all, you know, they were all really welcoming. Um, and I know in some way, some crazy way, I kind of missed that that bit of anxiety and nervousness a little bit. There's something, I don't know, there's something quite exciting about that. What's to come? You know, you don't know. And it, I, think that, I think that was in, almost now looking back, I think oh, that was a nice feeling now. What comes to your mind when, when we say nerves? Obviously, a lot of junior players, athletes listen to this podcast. Everybody suffers from nerves. Some it impedes their performance. Some it helps their performance. When we talk about nerves, what do you think and what advice would you give? I mean, straight away when you said nerves, I thought breathe. Um, and that is something that I learned or it's kind of a method or a tool, I guess, that I use to focus on my breath because I noticed that when... 
when I'm nervous or I'm anxious, I, I tend to hold my breath or have very short breath. I'm not using the full lung capacity. And my, my, my shoulders go up and it really affects my body language, which affects my, how my mind's working. And just by calming my breath down and being in control of my breath, I found that I could just breathe through it and, and actually feel the nerves and actually just acknowledge that they're there. They're there for a reason because you really care about this. And you train really hard for this, and this matters. So, yeah, you're nervous, and you don't really fully know how it's going to go. Nobody can predict the future. You can you can make plans, and you can do all the training and leave no stone unturned. But ultimately, you don't know how it's going to go. So there is going to be nerves, and that's almost... It was almost a worry if they weren't there, to be honest. And just that breathing... You know, I'm thinking about me in the tunnel just before we're going to walk out to do the anthems, maybe to, to start the game. That was the moment I really just just gave myself that moment to, to breathe and regulate my breathing. Mm. What advice would you give a young athlete um, who gets incredibly nervous before competing? Is there one or two tips, advice? Obviously, you gave breathing is a great one. Is there any anything else? Yeah, I think for, for me, I, would, I just try to focus on all the work that I've done and... You know, that's given me the foundation to go and deliver my best on this day. Whatever that might be, all I'm going to do is going to go out there and I'm going to try my very best. And nobody can ever ask any more of you than that. Yes, I'm going to make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. That's human nature. That's part of life. But I'm, I'm just going to still going to pick myself up. I'm going to go again. And I'm just going to keep giving my best and trying my best. And I think once you know whatever ha whatever the kind of result is whatever happens if I can come off and I know I've done that then I can be happy with myself which is the most important thing and so can my teammates or and coaches etc but first and foremost it's got to be you just being happy with your own effort and an input and dedication to, to doing your best mm. the second word is failure and we know that anyone who's reached a, a high level of success in any particular area you know a great example is yourself has experienced failure. What comes to your mind when you hear the word failure? I thought springboard. That was a word that popped into my head straight away. Um, because, I mean, I have experienced way more failure. I mean, I don't even... I, I mean, I should probably work it out, the percentages, but I have experienced so much failure and the real lows um, of, you know, not qualifying for the Olympic Games... Um, playing off for last place at a World Cup, losing 70% of our funding as a sport, you know, just real abject failure. And in each of those moments, it has, it has springboarded us into something incredible. So I do I do feel like, I think I had a poster when I was younger, something along the lines of... Um, Positivity is making the best out of whatever the situation you're with, your, which, with which you are dealt. And I think that's kind of how I tried to frame failure. Not immediately, obviously. I felt the failure deeply and I had to go through the whole grieving process. But I think off the back of that, there was always learning and there was always, always growth. Um, and so now, you know, I'm a bit older and a little bit wiser. Um, I try and keep that in mind, you know, when I'm going through them, still going through them, still go through some tough periods and some challenging times. And it's it's just keeping somewhere in the front of my mind, this will turn around and you will you will grow from this and you'll be stronger as a result of what you're feeling right now. Excellent advice. The third one is pressure. What comes to your mind when you hear the word pressure? Because obviously at, at, at especially elite level that you've played off there there is pressure a lot of pressure yeah emotion um i'm a really emotional person um and under pressure i only kind of really realized latterly in my career because of the coaching that we had and the training that we did what impact my emotions were having uh, on me and on my performance in a pressured situation but also what impact they were having on my teammates and people around me um, and so we did some really good training with our coach Danny Kerry in the later years the last seven years um, really focusing on can, how can I manage my state uh, under pressure um, how can I use my emotion as a, as a strength as a powerful tool 
um but absolutely to kind of harness it and not let it run away with itself mm, good advice uh let me ask you this resilience and grit where does that come from why are there some players that are just hard as nails tough never give up and some who we've obviously seen are more talented but are, are quit earlier quit easier where, where does resilience and grit come from I definitely, I mean, I, they have got literally got the book on my shelf, grit, and I've not read it yet. I need to read it. And that might. Oh, be don't worry. Book. I've got I've got two hundred unread books up up here. So. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't feel so bad. Um, I, I I do feel like it's it's something where there's been some, I don't know, struggle or something that you've had to overcome, and you've you've found a way through it and I think just having had that process maybe relatively early on in in life that it just builds that knowledge of I've got through that you know that was really hard and uh, I felt awful but I've got through it and I don't know how but if, especially if you're young you probably you know wouldn't be this would all be subconscious but I there was something that I feel like you could well if I've gotten through that I can get through anything and you just keep picking yourself up and you go again um that's got to be I know I feel like it's also got to be doing with the who the who are you surrounded by, the your family unit, your friends, the coaches. I feel like all those people certainly play a part in that, particularly when you're younger and you're just taking in all this information and um yeah. Mm. No, I agree. I mean I, I I believe that the two most important decisions you can make are the people you surround yourself with, and then the environment that you create. Um, now, obviously, it's very difficult if you, you know, if you're younger, of course, and you're at home, and that is your environment. But obviously, once we become adults, we get to choose who our friends are be are going to be, who our partner is going to be, where we're going to work. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll have people ask me, you know, my my office, my work office is so toxic or whatever and I said well you know obviously it's easy to say we'll move you know but you know there's bills to pay and there's a mortgage and so on and so forth but really at the end of the day is that is the the scenario if the environment's not going to change you've got to change the environment and and sometimes that involves moving on and even in a sports context is you've sometimes got to move clubs or move teams because of the the, the toxicity which is which which occurs of course You've just got to make sure that you're not the toxic one, which I, which I sometimes say to people. Maybe, you know, self-reflect first and say, have I contributed to this uh, this environment? And, and that's one of the most important questions. So, um, let me just one more question on on your playing uh, career, and then we're going to get into leadership. Is what do you miss most about playing your playing days? I don't, the all of it. I mean, the I think the the constant strive and struggle to be better as a person, and then to support and help and encourage and um, demand more of the people around me. I, I miss that. Just that the, the constantness of that. Just the every day coming in and being like, okay, where's where are the one percenters today? Where are the gains today? How can we make these little improvements? How can I help that person? How can I help that group of people? How can I improve myself? Just that every day. You miss the hustle. Um, yeah, I do. I do miss the hustle. I really, which see, you know, I think I meant quite a few years ago, but you know, at the time it felt. That at times felt quite stressful, but I did actually enjoy that. I actually enjoyed those elements of stress. They were good bits of stress for me. They were pushing me and challenging me and making me better. Um, so that's definitely what I miss. Mm. Now, obviously, you're a bronze medalist in, in 2012, and, and something happened there as well where you, uh, just correct me, you had a ball struck on your, was it on your face, or there was a particular injury? Sorry, my, my apologies, just flipped my mind there but you obviously missed a few games but you were able to come back for the third place playoff for the bronze against the Japanese right no so it was the first game against Japan that I okay, fractured sorry. my jaw so it was a stick um just caught me must have just been a sweet spot in my jaw and um yeah I missed 
two games and then came back and played the remaining two pool games and then semi-final and bronze medal game against New Zealand. Obviously, a bronze medal is just an incredible achievement in an Olympics Games. But was it a, a disappointment for the team that you know home Olympic Games, London, um, so close but so far? It was. It was in some ways disappointing. It will always be disappointing because that group that group means everything to me. We that was the first time I had a centralized program. It was the first time we'd had time to really think about our culture and the importance of culture. And our coach, Danny Kerry, empowered us as a team to build that culture. So we owned it, we drove it, we were responsible for it. And we'd set our vision back in 2009 as gold, which was, there's a lot of fear in the room about that vision. Um, But slowly, over time, we built that belief, we got results, and we really genuinely believed we were gold medal contenders going into the London Games. And... The semi-final loss against Argentina, it's 2-1. I just feel like if we played an extra 10 minutes, we would have at least equalised. And it was just so devastating. Um, it was so, it was quiet, it was desolate, it was heartbreaking. There was, you know, just real upset in the team because it had gone. That vision had gone. Our dreams had gone. Um and we had 24 hours to turn it around, you know, we had one rest day and then we were playing after that bronze medal game. So there was, it was a really special moment. And actually, you know, possibly because of where we were as that group, going through that grief process so quickly, turning it around and putting in the performance that we did in that bronze medal game, I think actually takes quite a lot of that disappointment away. Uh, and actually, I, I just feel intensely proud, proud that we trusted each other that we trusted in the process, that we represented the rest of the squad that weren't selected in the way that we wanted to. Um, and, yeah, it's always, you know, competitive people will always be tinged with a bit of disappointment, but I am ultimately proud of that whole squad of 28. So obviously you only had 24 hours to turn that around. So was it a case of, okay, we're going to be disappointed uh, you had 24 hours which is absolutely nothing and maybe in a, it was a blessing in disguise that it was like all right we got to snap out of this quick um because we've still got a bronze medal on the line which is you know which is a massive achievement um so was it a matter of waking up the next morning and saying okay new day and how can you remember any of the steps or team speeches that morning maybe from da- danny or yourself of to say okay we have to forget about last night or yesterday, and we move on today. Yeah, so we had a we had a leadership group. So myself and three other members of the squad were voted into the leadership group by the squad to lead on our culture. And I remember specifically meeting with Danny. So there's the four of us uh, sitting in Danny's tiny little room in the Olympic Village. Um, this was straight um, after the the, the the game against Argentina, or was it? The I think next it was the next morning. It was early next morning. Okay. And he wanted to get the, the group together and, and, as you said, you know, it's, you know, kind of rally the troops and say, OK, we have to put that to bed. And, and actually, we felt as a group that the team just needed to heal itself and that there needed to be an element of trust in people as individuals that they would get themselves right. Um, and that actually, almost kind of after the, the night of people processing it, to, to almost revisit revisit it that way the next morning would actually just take us all back a step. So it was a really good conversation. We had a really good debate about it, you know, a good bit of challenge. Um, and Danny trusted us and we decided to not have that talk. We then went off to pool recovery. So, you know, as lots of athletes do, we went and got into a local pool. And our strength and conditioning coach, Dave Hamilton, who is now the, um, I think he's lead science, sports science at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, okay. He he knew us very well, and he knew where we were, and he knew what we needed. So he kind of just went through the, the, the motions of the pool recovery, took us through it, and then he just chucked a, a ball into the pool and said, okay, play. And uh, we, we just played. We played volleyball, and it was like, okay, we can laugh again. We can smile again, we can joke again. And just through that day, we just, just each of us in our own way, just turned it around to the point where like one of the players, you know, didn't probably speak to many people for the whole 24 hours, but I trusted her and knew 
that when we got onto that pitch against New Zealand, she was going to give us 100%. And she did. She scored, played an unbelievable game. Um, and that was that was the trust that we built, I think, in that, in that group. And with Danny as well as coach. Mm. So one of the main solutions that I can take away from that is what's happened has happened. Let's have some fun. Let's ease everybody up a little bit, get into a different mindset because we can't carry that, if I can call it misery or disappointment, into the next game, so, so to say. So, um, no, magic stuff. Now, obviously, you went on to the 2016 Olympics and won gold, um, won every every match. Was there still a, a, a big part of the 2012 squad? Were they still part of the 2016 squad? And that was part of their motivation as well? Was was that the case? There was a good number. I should know this as well off the top of my head. There was a really good number, actually, that, that carried through. But I actually think we had a really, I mean, tempestuous couple of years after London. Um, you talked about toxic environment earlier. It did become very toxic and having been such a selfless group we went from went to being quite a selfish group why do you think um, why do you think that was okay i think it was a perfect storm um <laughs> we 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 didn't respect and fully acknowledge what we created in the lead up to london particularly around the culture behaviorally um and how it was led um by within the team and driven within the team um, we had a new coach and, you know, when I always, I'm always caveat is, you know, it's, it can never be about one person. So, you know, just because there's a new coach doesn't mean that the wheels fell off because of this new coach. Absolutely not. He was a good international coach. It was just a totally different style to what we've been used to with Danny. Um, different style of play, different system of play, different formation. Obviously some new players come in as well a new leadership style within the within the team he wanted. Um, and it just, I don't know if it was just too much change. Again, not respecting perhaps the culture that we created and, and using some of that to kind of push us forward. Um, and we, all, we just kind of lost our way a little bit. And it, it was really challenging because the first year in particular from the outside, it looks like we were doing okay. We, we qualified for the World Cup pretty easily. We won a silver medal at the European Championships. So from the outside, it seemed like it was great, going great guns. But on the inside, it just did not feel right and it didn't feel good. Um, and it kind of it culminated with the England team going to the World Cup in 2014 and, as I said earlier, playing off for the last place, which uh, honestly was just the darkest time. I think that is one of the darkest periods of my career just because where we'd been and what how what how we'd struggled to build and the lead up to London and to get where we'd gotten to to be down there again was just devastating. Um and probably personally for me, you know, I was well, I would have been 34 at that time. Just feeling it in every sense and feeling the failure as as the captain and the leader of that team as well, just really feeling it all. Um and I lost my way a little bit, as lots of us did at that point, and I needed to take some time away from the squad and um, and reflect and, and find myself again. And Danny Kerry then came back in as coach um, and led us to, to Rio. And after a lot of hard work and resetting of our culture, the, the rest is history. I mean, it just looks like the perfect competition. I mean, undefeated throughout the whole tournament, obviously beating the Netherlands in the final. I lived, I lived in the Netherlands for... Um, for a few years back in the early 2000s and they were just a you know a powerhouse in Holland and the publicity they got on 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 television every day it was massive you know that and that and uh, obviously a big sport in in Holland is skating indoor skating and you know they call it schaatsen uh, but but the hockey as well i just remember um the amount of publicity they would get there as well so yeah mm -hmm. we're massive but that's that that was just an incredible 2016 for you guys so I'm sure that was a massive relief as well. Yeah, huge relief. Um, you felt like 17 years of trying. You know, Sydney was 2000, you know, 16 years. Sydney was year 2000 all the way to 2016 to finally, you know, go and achieve that gold medal. And, you know, the Dutch were going for their third gold medal in a row. Just a phenomenal, as you said, just phenomenal hockey playing country and a phenomenal women's team um, over that. 12 year period so yeah it, it felt 
it felt really, I felt so proud. I felt so proud that we turned it around as a, as a group of women and our coaching staff. I felt really, yeah, I just felt like we, we'd, we'd worked so incredibly hard and I, and I felt very proud. Excellent. Going on to leadership and um, obviously I'd love to go here because you were the captain at the young age of 20, 23 and obviously there'd been players in the team that were far more experienced than you and, and so on and so forth. But you went on to, to captain the team for 13 years, as I mentioned at the beginning, was I mean, a phenomenal uh, amount of time to be, to be a captain. What were some of the qualities that you felt that you had as a captain? Now, I know it's, it's not easy to talk about yourself and say, well, I was good at this, I was good at that. But maybe some feedback you had from players who said, you know, you're really you're really good at this or good at that, you know? I know it's not easy to talk about yourself, but <laughs> because you are you are super hum- humble and you have a lot of humility, but what do you feel um, were your strengths in, in leading a team? I mean, to be honest, when I was 23, I really did not. I was voted in by my teammates as well, um, which was a massive honour. And to, the only thing I really kind of clung on to at that point was, the, was how I really push myself to set a good example to set the very best example that I could the f- and I think players saw that in me and then kind of wanted to follow me in that regard but then also was there was an allowance there that I could then challenge them because they knew that I was challenging myself hard every day to do my you know work harder in the fitness training push myself and, and learn and grow and to make mistakes and and improve um, in, in in a hockey sense. So I think they saw me doing that, and I think um, then allowed me to then challenge them to be better as well because they knew I, I really just wanted the best for them. I wanted the best for the team. Um, and in the particularly early days, that is all that I thought about, and all that I you know really thought about my leadership. Um, did you have a mentor? Like, did you have a mentor? So, sorry, did you have a mentor in a way to help you lead, lead the team? That would have been really helpful. Um, no, <laughs> no, not no. And I really wished, I really wished I'd had it away. But I, I guess I don't know. We find our own way, don't we? I, I, I became quite obsessed with learning about it, so I started to read lots of books and on leadership, but also around culture and the importance of culture and how leaders can can lead on the culture and what impact that has on the team and on performance. So. Like I mean, that pretty old school books like Bill Walsh's book and the scoreline takes care of itself, and um, Phil Jackson's book Eleven Rings. Like I loved both of those for different reasons. It was you know similar in terms of how you how you look after yourself and how you look after your people and what it says about you and the values that you have and how you bring them to the fore as a leader. Um, and that's I guess that is then what I over the years tried to to focus on was. Well, who am I and what can I bring? So I'm, what does Danny used to say to me? I'm not sure if you're going to give me a hug or slap me around the face. I'm, I'm, um, I'm really caring and nurturing and supportive, but I'm also demanding, direct um, and challenging at times. So it's, you know, I think once I would, I'd kind of been able to communicate that with players and be clear with that and where I was and where we were at as a team, I think players, again, and like that from me, that ability to be really caring and nurturing and supportive and want the best from them, but also caring and nurturing and supportive can also look like a demanding, you know, hard word or, um, you know, some focus on discipline. So um, I think those are the things that I that I focused on. Um, and then just in a game sense, I suppose, just the, the knowledge of the game, the reading of the game, the ability to communicate the game, um, to manage the game. I think those are, again, good... Um, Good things that I had that I tried to be as a leader. Mm. Um, the hard conversations, having the tough conversations, which is obviously the, the the one of the roles of of a leader as well. How did you go about approaching a hard conversation with another player? I mean, I hate conflict. Having said, I like you know, I'm demanding and um, I like challenge. I, I I found having challenging conversations with with the coach I found that a little bit um easier in some ways I think because I felt like I had I was the voice of the team and I felt like I had their backing um I think that enabled me to have some of those difficult conversations with coaching staff 
Um, but with peers, sometimes I found that more challenging. Um, but I think towards the end, I started to see that rather than, you know, all the fear and anxiety that I was having in the lead up to that conversation, to remember that there's another person in this conversation and actually I needed to just think about this from their point of view and actually I was doing them a disservice if I did not have this conversation Mm -hmm. particularly if it was going to if I felt it was going to make them better so however challenging this conversation is going to be however difficult it might be in the moment and the the lead up actually I'm going to kick myself for months years and it might have an impact on our eventual outcome if I don't have this conversation now and I think that was kind of instilled in us in the team as, as well. In the lead up to Rio, we had a we had behaviour statements, and one of the statements, um, one of the behaviours was we stamp out fires early, and that kind of plays into that. You know, what was, that, sorry, what was that again, Kate? Sorry, we stamp out fires early. Okay. So it's um, just that ability to there's little sparks going off all the time in a team because we're all different, different opinions, different points of view. Which is good. You really want that. You need those little sparks. But unless you have time and space to air all those grievances and bits of friction and challenge, unless they are aired um, under the pressure of a tournament, Olympic Games, they just become massive raging wildfires. So I think for us, it's, it was just do it early, say it early, have a conversation before it gets to that point where it's that fire's too hard to, to put out. Um, and so we, I think that's kind of what everybody bought into uh, in the team. It, it's very similar to, um, you know, one of the cultures I've really spent a lot of time studying in the last few years has been the Mercedes Formula One um, team who've been incredibly successful with Lewis Hamilton and, and so on. And even if motorsport is not your your thing or not, you know, they have a, they have a saying, see it, say it, fix it. And it, it sounds very similar to yours as, you know, Stamp out fires early. If you see it, say it. You know, let's 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 talk about it. Let's get it out of the way. But I think you're absolutely right. Is that that's where most problems fester and 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 grow? Is that they're not addressed. They're type of swept under the carpet, and they're we hope that will go away, and they don't go away. They actually grow. Um, I mean, it's it's a great lesson in 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 relationships as well and partners is that you know it's the same thing if, if you let something just go it's going to become bigger in the end so um you're now a coach what are two things that you look for in a captain if you were choosing a captain for your team now, obviously you mentioned that there's different types um mm-hmm. you know there's vocal there's ones that are quiet that don't have to say much maybe that was a little bit like you where your example spoke louder than your words in a way. I know Steven Gerrard was that kind of captain as well, where he, he wasn't extremely vocal. I mean, I've spent some time at, at Glasgow Rangers there, and he doesn't say much. Mm-hmm. But when he does talk, people listen, and you know, mm-hmm. he's, that's his style. So what do you look for in a captain? I, I do think, set an example, I do think that's imperative. I think it now, as a, as a coach, I'm still, you know, I'm a leader. I need to set the example. If we've decided what we want to be about as a team, what our values are, and what our behaviours are, I need to, to lead on that. I need to role model those behaviours and values and, and be about that. So I do think setting the example for me is really high on the list of things that I look for. And then, and then I just think an authenticity um but it's 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 really them it is again who they are it's they're not trying to be something else um it's really genuine and authentic and because we have i think people will follow that um i think if it's you know this is what i think they want from me or this is this is the mask i'm going to put on today because this is what they need from me i think people see through that over time so i i um i think that's i think they're yeah I'd say that the two things. Yeah. I think it's very much like like children as well, and obviously you're going to experience this in the years to come, is that they don't necessarily remember your words, but they remember what you did. So actions speak louder than words, for for example. So I'm good. I obviously want to be respectful of your time. It's Friday night there. I'm sure there's nothing more you'd rather do on a Friday night than be on a podcast, Kate. So uh, thanks so much. Um, one or two last questions. 
If you could change one rule or something in hockey today, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. If any. Uh, um, do you know? I'm not sure I'd change any. I think we, I'm in. I'm actually on the athletes commission for the International Hockey Federation, and this this is um, a topic that's discussed reasonably regularly. And actually, I think we've had so many rule changes um, over the last, I don't know, decade, maybe 15 years, that actually I think we, we should just consolidate where we are. It's, it's such a fast game. It's an exciting game. There's lots of goals. Um, I think that we're growing still with, with tactics and as new coaches come through with fresh ideas, they're changing the game and they're changing the way the rules can kind of be adapted a little bit. So I think I think we should, I think we should keep keep where we are personally very well answered <laughs> all right final part it's quick fire questions i'm going to put you on the spot here so you're going to have to answer quick you can answer either one word or a sentence are you ready oh, yeah favorite food curry uh, favorite city visited oh, seattle interesting was it raining <laughs> Good chance. I think it has the highest rainfall in, in the United States. Um, favorite music or group, band, musician? Oh, that I love all music. Um, I'm going to say hip-hop. Okay. Uh, favorite movie? Oh, love Actually. Okay. Favorite cereal? God, Lord. Um... Cornflakes, really boring. <laughs> uh, favorite book that you've read? Oh, that's so hard. I mean, Memoirs of a Geisha, I absolutely loved. And book you're reading right now? Um, what am I reading right now? I've just finished Glennon Doyle's Untamed. Um, I think it's a book called Trans Like Me. I can't think of the author, but it's a it's about trans men and women and that whole experience. I'm really interested in that. Okay, interesting. Um, I'm usually one of those people that read three books at once, so I'm in the mood for that one. I'll read a bit of that one. Um, you know, I just can't read one book. But like I said earlier on, I have I have this bad habit of ordering books and they just pile up and I never get to read them. So anyway. Um, Favorite sports event on your bucket list you'd love to attend? Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't expect I'm a, that one. I'm a 49er. Okay, San Francisco. Yeah, amazing city, huh? Yeah, amazing. Very expensive. City. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, favorite sports team besides GB Hockey England, but but favorite sports team? Manchester United. Oh boy, I think we're going to have to end this pretty pretty early. So, I think Tr <laughs> Tracy Neville will be very happy to hear that, Kate. I know, I know. Fellow Mancunian. Oh, man. Lunch with any person, dead or alive, who would it be? That's really hard. I'm going to say Michelle Obama. Nice choice. Um, if you hadn't have been a professional uh, hockey player, what other sport would you have liked to have been professional in? Oh. Or oh, athletics. Yeah, 200 meters. Track? Yeah, track, 200 meters, definitely. And that's coming from someone that, that said a little bit earlier that they didn't enjoy running. Yeah, and I learned to love it, and 200 meters was my distance. Not too far, it's not too short. <laughs> just, in, just enough, around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, final question is, um, in your opinion, what does it take to be champion-minded? The discipline. I think the discipline to make the choices, to feel like the choices, not sacrifices, to go all in on something, regardless of the outcome. I think that takes discipline. Love it. Discipline and all in. This has been amazing. Um, as I expected it would be, Kate, thanks so much for taking the time, especially on a Friday night. Um, but if there's uh, some of our followers that would love to... Um, 
reach you or, or, or follow you? What's the best way? Do you have a, a website or on, on social media? Social media, um, Twitter, I think it's Kate Walsh 11. You're asking me now questions that I'm not sure. I, I can take a look as well and, and, and include that. So Instagram, I think it's Kate Walsh 11 GB. Uh, Kate, thank you so much. I wish you all the best for, for the year ahead. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for yeah, talking to me. As I said, I've heard so many of your podcasts and it just feels like a real honour to be on that long list of, uh, of amazing interviews. So thank you for your time. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed that one with Kate. Uh, those social media accounts, again, her Instagram is KateWalsh11GB and her Twitter account is at KateWalsh. 11. I really enjoyed that interview with her and uh, I've really enjoyed following her as well on social media. So I hope you guys do too. As always, this podcast is available on iTunes, Amazon Podcasts, YouTube and via my website, alistairmccord.com. All books available on Amazon. As always, remember, you were made for greatness. Now go do the work. Stay champion-minded. Stay champion-minded.